there's quite a few people here and I think we can we can give it the green light. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce myself. My name is Nuno. I am the operations manager for the Dyslexia Association of London, which is a local dyslexia association charity that operates in London. Um, we uh, work under the umbrella of the BDA, um, but we're still independent. And this is a webinar series that we run bi-monthly where we get speakers and people and specialists um, in dyslexia, uh, as well as other um, crossing over learning difficulties and differences such as dyscalculia. And we haven't done the dyscalculia uh, webinar um, ever. So, and there's been a lot of requests. So. Um, King, Dr. King and Mursani was kind enough to um, answer my request uh, and we're very lucky to have her today here with us. And Dr. King uh, is a senior lecturer at the Loughborough University where she teaches mathematical cognition and she is also pushing for a um, an application uh, that helps people uh, called Numeralis, an app which includes a standardized screening instrument for dyscalculia and tasks to assess the broader cognitive profile of learners. So this is some exciting stuff here. So um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Kinga, and you can begin your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Nuno. So I try to share my uh, slides now. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a second. It, it worked when we tried earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah you've, you've still got the permissions, so. Okay. Um, it should be all right. Okay, I think it should work now. Can you see my slides? Yes, I can see your slides. Oh, okay. That's is everybody great. able to see them as well? Okay, and you can hear me all right as well? Yeah, yeah we're all okay, good. So I, I start. Um, yeah, so this presentation is about this Arcudia and uh, as Nuno said, oh, I, yeah, I should start by saying thank you so much for this invitation. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you today and talk to you about this Arcudia. So uh, like Nuno said, I'm um, working at Loughborough University as a senior lecturer in mathematical cognition. My background is in psychology, so I'm a developmental cognitive psychologist and so I so today I will give you a researcher's perspective on this calculia but I hope um, you will find this interesting and and uh, useful as well okay so so what I will cover in my talk today uh, first of all I will give you a little bit of uh, context to this calculia in terms of numeracy levels in the UK and uh, why I think it's really important to diagnose people with this calculia. Uh, then I will actually discuss the diagnostic uh, process for dyscalculia and then I will go into more details about whether dyscalculia is, is really just about mathematics or whether there are other um, areas of uh, difficulty associated with dyscalculia. I will also talk about um, like co-occurring developmental conditions and then uh, finally I have um, a short section on how we can support people with dyscalculia. Okay so in terms of the, uh, the context, um, so what we know from official statistics is that um, about half of the, uh, the, the adult working age population in England have the numeracy levels of a primary school pupil so there is, there is a general problem with numeracy levels in the UK and only about one in four or one in five adults um, can be considered functionally numerate which means that they are uh, really confident uh, with dealing with numbers in, in everyday situations. Uh, we also have a problem with uh, maths inequality in the UK uh, so just to give you um, an example uh, by the end of secondary school so when pupils um, finish their compulsory education, the gap between the highest and lowest achieving students in mathematics uh, equals to around eight years of schooling. So the, this is a large difference and it's actually larger than in most other countries um, in the world. 
And why is it important to consider low numeracy? So sometimes people feel like saying, oh, I'm not good at math or not, not very good with numbers. It's like, okay, and it's quite um, socially um, acceptable to, to say these things and, and people um, don't feel too bad about this. But actually we know from research evidence that, that um, mathematics difficulties are not just problematic in terms of academic achievement and, and uh, in career opportunities or in terms of career opportunities, but um, they, also, they are also linked to increased risks of unemployment, uh, mental and physical illness, and also even sometimes a higher rates of um, arrest and incarceration. And, and this happens even in the presence of adequate literacy. So we know that these negative um, consequences are really down to um, mathematics problems and not generally low uh, academic skills. Um, and what we also know, and this comes from my own research, is that, um, I mean, we know that, that um, dyscalculia is very much underdiagnosed both in the UK and in many other countries, but actually I had a study where we found that dyslexia was about 100 times more likely to be diagnosed in the UK than dyscalculia, and it also means that dyscalculic pupils are much less likely to be um, to be uh, noticed and to receive uh, appropriate support in educational contexts. Uh, so why why is it important to actually diagnose people with dyscalculia? I mean, um, I I think it might be obvious um, uh, to many of you, but sometimes I I hear teachers saying like, oh, we we don't really want to label. Uh, pupils, we just want to um, consider their needs, but I, I find that uh, a diagnosis, an official diagnosis, can often be very uh, useful uh, for people. So one thing is, uh, which is kind of obvious, is that if you don't have an official diagnosis, you are not eligible to specialist support, uh, including financial support, and also you don't get any reasonable adjustments or any other recognition of your disability. Also, I think it's it's a problem that if you don't have a diagnosis, it looks like, um, I mean, it, it just seems like dyscalculia basically doesn't exist. It doesn't appear in official statistics. And, um, and of course, there are fewer government-funded pro uh, programs aimed, aimed at dyscalculia because it seems like an almost non-existing condition. Um, I also uh, hear from a lot of people that especially people who are diagnosed uh, later in life that that once once they are diagnosed they like feel like sometimes uh, somehow things start to make sense and and somehow they finally understand what was going on with them so they they might have had uh, the feeling that they were somehow different from many other people but but uh, it can often help to put a label on it even uh, like just finding relevant information and also um like uh, connecting with other people uh, with the dyscalculia diagnosis and sharing information. And we also know that dyscalculia is often uh, associated with uh, mental health problems. So this is not specific to dyscalculia. This often happens uh, with people with different developmental conditions. And so uh, anxiety and depression and feelings of, you know, somehow uh, not fitting in uh, can be alleviated if people feel part of a dyscalculic community. And I can also say from a researcher's perspective that um, if we had more people diagnosed with dyscalculia, it would be much easier to recruit people from research studies and to learn more about this condition. So, so this is um, another reason why it could be very useful. So now I'm going to talk about um, the, the key indicators of dyscalculia. So basically how dyscalculia is officially diagnosed. Um, so to be diagnosed with dyscalculia, you should have persistent and substantial uh, difficulties in mathematics learning and using academic skills. And these difficulties should be present uh, even if you had adequate teaching and sometimes uh, appropriate interventions as well. So the idea is that these should be persistent uh, difficulties which are not very easy to uh, eliminate with um, targeted interventions. 
um, we, I guess it's it's kind of the same for all developmental conditions that that you wouldn't uh, normally um, get a diagnosis unless uh, your difficulties are significant enough to interfere with your academic and occupational performance or with uh, with activities of daily living. So, so people should experience substantial difficulties uh, to be diagnosed with dyscalculia. Um, uh, how you actually do this? So there are two parts of the diagnostic process. The first one um, is to use um, age and um, level of education, um, uh, appropriate uh, standardized achievement measures. So basically uh, it, it is to establish that your mathematics skills are really very significantly below what you would be expected for your age and level of education. And this should be also uh, combined with a comprehensive clinical assessment. And this clinical assessment uh, should include um, like taking into account uh, the person's developmental, medical, uh, family and educational histories, uh, school reports, uh, and also like it can be in the form of uh, interviewing the person. So for example, one reason to have this um, clinical synthesis is to establish when uh, problems with mathematics started. For example, in the case of an adult uh, who is seeking diagnosis, uh, you would expect that their problems um, must have started very early in life. So probably uh, they should have been apparent at least by the age of six or seven. Um, and also uh, the other aim of this clinical synthesis is that you can exclude um, other potential sources um, of mathematics difficulties uh, which are which we don't consider uh, as um, like potential causes for this uh, dyscalculia so for example you wouldn't diagnose somebody with dyscalculia if they had uh, intellectual disabilities or if they had some um, some mental or neurological uh, problems which could cause uh, math difficulties, or mm, you should also consider if the person has vision or hearing or other sensory difficulties. So these can cause um, mathematics problem without like having um, dyscalculia as a developmental condition. And also you want to exclude uh, some environmental factors. So for example, if the person didn't have access to um, uh, to proper education, or if they are not proficient in the language of education. Um, and uh, I guess, I mean, uh, I think it's important to consider that these can also be risk factors uh, for this calculia. So if you, if you speak English uh, as your second language, for example, you might be more vulnerable uh, to develop this calculia if you already had a predisposition uh, to this. But I mean, it, it's important to establish as part of the diagnostic process that your problems are not just down to uh, language difficulties, for example. And I think it's also important to, uh, to consider that severity levels uh, can vary um, from person to person. Okay, so in terms of which areas of mathematics are impacted, so this is um, an interesting question in terms of the history of uh, dyscalculia. So uh, in the past, dyscalculia was often described as a specific difficulty in arithmetic skills, but now um, there's, there's a general recognition that it, it impacts more or less all areas of uh, mathematics learning. And so I, I'm just presenting here a study that I did with, um, with some collaborators where we looked at mathematics difficulties across different areas of the school curriculum. So you can see these uh, bars represent um, uh, counting, number facts, calculation, shape, measurement, and data handling. And the two groups that we present the results for are a dyscalculic uh, group of children and a merged uh, group of control or control group of children. And what you can see, I mean, uh, maybe it, it looks like a busy graph to you, but but basically um, the control group was not just significantly better in all areas of the school curriculum, but it was um, the difference between groups was the same uh, regardless of the area of the school curriculum. So this study suggests that uh, children with dyscalculia would be equally imp impaired in all like um, 
important areas of the uh, current uh, school curriculum. And what we also found in this study is that um, group differences are larger when children have to generate their responses. So when they respond to open-ended question, questions rather than um, uh, multiple choice uh, or as compared to multiple choice questions. Okay, so what does um, uh, this calculia look like in everyday life? So is it is it just about uh, mathematics difficulties? So this is um, this is a description from a person who doesn't have an official diagnosis of dyscalculia, but they think that they probably have dyscalculia. So they say that uh, all my experiences with mathematics, uh, time, orientation, and so on, point towards uh, this, be this being a condition that I suffered from. And then they go on to describe um, how they um, mix up dates and how they uh, struggle with uh, reading the clock, for example. So it kind of uh, suggests that um, this calculia extend to uh, contexts outside of um, of school and outside of educational, um, yeah, outside of educational um, settings. Um, okay, so what are the typical non math related problems uh, that you can see uh, in this calculia? Uh, so one thing, uh, I mean, I already mentioned that mental health issues are unfortunately uh, common um, in uh, different developmental conditions, and it's also the, uh, the case for this calculia, so low self-esteem, anxiety, and depression um, uh, might co-occur with this calculia. And sometimes in, in school children, you can also uh, see some externalizing or so-called externalizing um, conduct problems like aggression, for example. Um, and uh, you, I, I will talk about uh, this a bit later, but um, but um, this uh, dyscalculia is often co-occurs with other developmental conditions such as dyslexia, ADHD, and uh, communication difficulties. Um, and then from research, we can also see that um, that there are some uh, kind of uh, so-called domain general cognitive skills that may be affected in this calculia. So what we mean by domain general skills is that these are not specific to the area of mathematics, but more general cognitive skills. So these uh, include verbal and visual spatial working memory, um, inhibition. So when you have to inhibit responses, for example, uh, to some stimuli. So, so you, typically how we measure inhibition is that people respond to a task and sometimes they get the signal um, to inhibit, um, to not give the response. Uh, and um, so, so this calculic people might make more mistakes in these kinds of tasks. Uh, we also see uh, impairments in attentional function, uh, sequencing skills, so such as um, like, for example, remembering uh, the temporal order of events, so how, in what order, uh, things happened or learning new movement sequences, for example, when you when you are dancing or or when you play music. Uh, and you can also see uh, problems with logical reasoning skills. So this is kind of an overview of different everyday um, areas of difficulty that you might see in this calculia. Uh, so you can see that, of course, you have um, you have some specific maths related difficulties, but also, uh, like I mentioned, like telling and keeping track of time, um, uh, spatial orientation, following sequential directions, learning musical concepts, um, like um, telling left from right, and uh, so some learning some abstract concepts of time and direction. So these can all be uh, present in this calculia, and of course, there can be issues with dealing with uh, money as well. Okay, so in terms of the um, like how researchers um, try to explain this co-occurrence of um, these these seemingly distinct type type of difficulties, so the idea is that that there is a common system in our brain uh, which represents uh, time, space, and number. So, so uh, and basically, uh, what, how you can imagine this? So, for example, um, we often, uh, or especially when children first learn about numbers, they often use a, a number line uh, at school. So, so it's kind of common uh, to see um, 
numbers mapped onto space, but we also use uh, space uh, for representing time. So for example, uh, in this mental timeline, um, you can see the development of a plant and, and this is something which is quite intuitive. So it's very easy for us uh, to kind of use the spatial representation to, um, to, to represent a sequence of um, temporal or a temporal sequence. So somehow the idea, or you can see this representation of uh, the evolution of uh, man, for example. So, so you can, um, we, we kind of uh, use these um, uh, in society as typical representations, but uh, the idea is that we also have some kind of a common system in the brain to represent time, space, and number. And, and maybe this is something uh, which is implicated in this calculia. However, um, it's not just one part of the brain, so it would be a, a mistake to think that this calculia only impacts on uh, one area of the, or, or one specific area of the brain. So actually what we know from uh, numerical cognition research is that um, uh, many, many parts of the, of the brain um, are involved in processing numbers. So, so we, we have different systems dealing with um, um, like reading numbers, um, processing quantity information, um, we often need working memory. Uh, for example, if we perform um, arithmetic operations, we often have to stay, take uh, several steps to solve a problem and we have to keep in mind the different kind of um, like um, immediate or intermediate uh, results of uh, these operations. Uh, and of course we need uh, attention uh, control as well. So the idea is that there are these many different parts, interconnected parts of the brain participating in um, mathematics and uh, impairment in any of um, any parts of this network could lead to mathematics difficulties. So, and for this reason, um, often, uh, so this calculia is, is often described as a very heterogeneous condition because some people might just have problems uh, with um, uh, with one uh, part of the system and others could have problems in other parts of the system. And because these all interact with each other when we process numbers and when we do mathematics, um, sometimes maybe the, the result could be the same, but, but the underlying processes <coughs> could be quite different in different people. Uh, so, so this is important to keep in mind that that uh, there's not just one part of the brain um, which is in, implicated in this calculia, but probably like um, a quite um, distributed uh, big system um, within our brain. Okay, so I also wanted to talk about uh, co-occurring conditions with this calculia. Uh, so this is um, uh, results from uh, one of my, uh, or these are results from one of my uh, studies. So um, if you, I mean, this might be <coughs> a bit <coughs> difficult for you to read uh, this table, but basically the main part, the most uh, important part is the last column of this table, which, which um, uh, is the odds ratio. So what it shows is how much more uh, common uh, are these difficulties um, in this calculia than uh, in people. So so basically, uh, for example, cognitive and learning difficulties are um, more than six times more likely uh, to co-occur uh, with dyscalculia than to be present in people who are not dyscalculic. So you can see that there are some conditions which have a much higher risk um, if you are dyscalculic than if you are not uh, dyscalculic. So these are cognitive and learning difficulties, speech and language difficulties, autism spectrum disorder, communication and interaction difficulties, and ADHD. And yeah, I, I mean, uh, well, dyslexia, interestingly, in, in our study, it wasn't um, a very commonly uh, noted condition, um, but it, it is, again, uh, a condition which is often described as a typical co-occurring condition with dyslexia or dyscalculia, sorry. Yeah, and I think uh, I just wanted to say as well that that although 
very often people just have one diagnostic label if they have a diagnosis of a developmental condition. But what what we start to see now, and I think what more, more and more people uh, acknowledges is that um, is that actually uh, comorbidity or co-occurrence of developmental conditions is the rule rather than the exception. So most people um, should have more than one uh, diagnosis if they have a developmental condition. Okay, so because this is a, a seminar for the, the London Dyslexia Association or the associate, um, sorry, maybe I got the, the name wrong, but because you are probably all interested in dyslexia, um, I thought I would talk a little bit about <coughs> um, like dyslexia and dyscalculia and how these two conditions might be related. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so, so what we see in research is that, uh, like I said before, um, yeah, dyslexia and dyscalculia are, are considered to be often or, or too often co-occur in people. And what we see in the literature is also a substantial overlap in genetic influences on reading and mathematics. So this suggests that there, there could be some kind of uh, so-called generalist genes uh, which, uh, which are associated with educational outcomes and including reading and mathematics and intelligence. Um, in people. Uh, we also see very strong correlations uh, at the population level between reading and mathematics uh, skills uh, of uh, children. And uh, also, if you are familiar with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the, D the DSM-5, which is often used by educational psychologists, it also lists uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia under the the common umbrella term of specific learning disorders, which kind of suggests that, that these are somehow, these, these belong to the same category or same family of, uh, of developmental conditions. However, um, uh, you can also see in the literature that often um, researchers argue that mathematics difficulties in dyslexia are distinct from uh, mathematics difficulties in um, like dyscalculia without reading difficulties. So, for example, one big study which looked at several um, other papers or several other researchers' work uh, concluded that there are basically two different types of, of mathematics difficulties. One is associated with reading problems and verbal working memory impairments, and another type, which would be kind of pure dyscalculia, is when you don't have reading problems but in this case, uh, the typical finding is that you have uh, visual spatial working memory problems. And also some other studies suggest that uh, phonological processing deficits could lead to some problems with mathematics. Uh, for example, uh, retrieving arithmetic facts, but then other areas of mathematics wouldn't be affected because they are not reliant so much on, on verbal uh, codes. Okay, so so uh, it could be also an interesting question to consider whether there are gender differences in this calculia, especially because we know that uh, there are many developmental conditions uh, where, is, uh, where there is a gender difference. So, for example, uh, in autism, you, you see that uh, much more um, uh, males are uh, diagnosed with autism than females. And this is also common in ADHD and even in uh, dyslexia. So actually what you see <coughs> in this calculia is that most studies report no gender differences. So basically they find that dyslexia and dyscalculia are equally common in uh, males and females. And uh, uh, this is also what we found in, in um, a big population-based study that we did in, in Northern Ireland that um, about 6% of uh, male pupils or boys and 5.5% of um, girls uh, had uh, this calculia uh, in the sample, which was not statistically different. So it was a very similar rate. And what we also found, and I think I, I just wanted to mention it because there is often this uh, stereotype that, um, that uh, boys are better than girls in maths. So when we looked at 
uh, the up the top five percent uh, of the population. So those pupils who had the highest levels of mathematics skills in the same study, we found no gender differences at all. So actually, um, girls and boys were equally likely to be in the top five percent um, in terms of uh, mathematics performance and in the in the bottom five percent as well. Okay, so I, I also, I mean, this is something that I'm not so sure you are very familiar with, but uh, when I give presentations to teachers, um, they often, um, uh, they are often interested in the relationships between dyscalculia and mathematics anxiety. So mathematics anxiety is basically when you are really anxious about maths and when you see numbers, you get confused and, and you experience this uh, feeling that your mind goes blank and you don't know how to how to deal with numbers and i mean this would be the extreme case but many many people experience, experience uh, some level of uh, mathematics anxiety and so the question is um what's what's the relationship between this calculia and maths anxiety are they related are they completely independent and i would say that there is uh, quite good evidence that these are uh, conditions which which are um which have separate developmental origins and separate mechanisms through which they can impair mathematics performance. Uh, so, uh, so basically what you see in this calculia is that uh, you have some kind of uh, basically processing problems, so they, um, some problems with uh, dealing with numbers, um, which, which comes from your cognitive architecture and in mathematics anxiety, what you see is that um, you you have all the all the relevant skills uh, and um, you are able to deal with numbers and actually you can have a very high, or you can achieve very high levels of mathematics performance. But the problem is that when you feel mathematics anxiety, it interferes with this uh, performance. So. Uh, your working memory capacity is occupied by anxious thoughts and you are unable to really use your um, like cognitive resources to uh, focus on mathematics because mathematics tends to be quite demanding of working memory resources. So if, if you are kind of um, in, like your mind is flooded with thoughts like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this problem. I don't know. I, I will run out of time and so on then you are unable to perform uh, mathematics tasks uh, properly. Uh, so, so what you see in this graph uh, that I put in this slide, so basically the if you see the little black dots, so each, each dot represents or each circle represents uh, an individual within the sample and the x axis is uh, maths anxiety, the y axis is mathematics performance. So you can see the black dots are people with dyscalculia and uh, if you look at the distribution of uh, this dot pattern, basically a, a person with dyscalculia might have very high levels of anxiety, but they might also have quite or, or moderate or quite low levels of anxiety as well. So it looks like just the fact that you are dyscalculic doesn't uh, make you necessarily very mass anxious. And um, what we can also see is that uh, people with high levels of mathematics anxiety. So if you look at kind of the top of the, uh, this graph is that many of them still perform quite well um, in, oh, sorry, so uh, no, if you look at um, the right hand side of this graph, so that's people with high levels of mathematics anxiety. So what you see is that uh, that many of them actually perform quite well in mathematics. What What you don't see is that they don't reach to the highest uh, levels of mathematics performance. So very few of them have really outstanding mathematics skills. And this is because mathematics anxiety really interferes uh, with their ability to, to perform uh, extremely well at uh, mathematics, even if they had uh, the necessary knowledge and skills. So I mean, I hope this is a, a clear distinction, but you can ask me more questions at the end. And this is really um, my final uh, slide, which is, I mean, I'm sure many of you are interested in how you can support people with dyscalculia. I, I should say that there's not so much, uh, I mean, there is research about this, of course, but, but I mean, not 
uh, not so much that I could uh, offer you as a quick fix. Um, so I guess one, one important consideration, um, for example, if you are a teacher or a parent uh, of a dyscalculic uh, child is to think about, like consider the heterogeneity of dyscalculia that um, that different people with uh, dyscalculia might have uh, different profiles of difficulties. So in terms of processing speed, or like I mentioned, verbal and spatial working memory resources, attentional problems. So I think it's important to start um, to try to kind of unpick what is what are the main difficulties or what are the main underlying cognitive um, uh, basis of their problems with mathematics. And um, I guess it's also important uh, with interventions that because a pupil's knowledge might lag several years behind their school grades. So if you want to offer help with mathematics to go back to the basics, don't try to um, get the pupil to catch up with their peers because it might not be possible. But um, mathematics is a really cumulative subject. So going back to the basic and trying to build up knowledge from there and build build confidence with the basics uh, can really make a big difference in uh, learning new content as well and catching up. Um, yeah, and then I guess um, the earlier uh, pupils would get diagnosed, um, there's a, the higher likelihood that uh, that intervention could be successful. So it's really important to try to uh, identify dyscalculia early and then uh, provide appropriate uh, intervention. And in terms of um, what this could be, I mean, there is a debate about this. So some approaches uh, recommend using manipulative, so concrete objects, um, which makes or which help children to to kind of link magnitudes to um, to to like physical size, for example. Uh, so so these um, uh, these could help and uh, like. In terms of what you can find in the home environment, so for example, traditional board games uh, where you use dice can be very useful, and also where you have to move a pawn, and and uh, as you move it, you link um, specific numbers to distances. So how how far um, <coughs> you move uh, <coughs> in on on the board. So so this can be also really helpful, especially uh, for young children. And I mean, some some researchers would argue that actually dyscalculia is <coughs> is just the very low end of the mass um, uh, ability continuum, and you could just uh, use exactly the same methods of teaching with them uh, as with any other pupils. I mean, I think some specialists uh, would be skeptical about this view, but this is also a, a view that is present in the literature. And then in terms of how you can support adults, so there is some assistive technology available, for example, some calculators where, um, which um, recognize, so if you uh, want to enter some numbers, you don't have to type them in, so you don't have to deal with um, place values, but it would uh, enter the numbers for you and also, or you can just enter numbers and it, read it reads it out for you, so it it kind of kind of helps with uh, any issues with uh, place values, uh, for example, and yeah. So I just wanted to. So that's basically the end of my uh, presentation. I just wanted to mention if there are uh, any of you here who have uh, a diagnosis of dyslexia, we would be really interested. Or if you have mathematics difficulties, uh, we would be very interested in. Um, like in, in inviting you uh, to a study where we look at uh, mathematics difficulties in dyslexia, but also we, we, we are also really interested in people without mathematics difficulties. So we are trying to kind of understand uh, who are the people with dyslexia <coughs> who will develop mathematics difficulties and who are uh, those people with dyslexia who, who won't have any uh, difficulties with mathematics. So. Um, yeah, there is a link in this slide uh, where you can sign up for this study or you can also just use uh, the QR code. And um, finally, I just also, I don't know if there are any teachers um, <clears throat> here today, but we also have, um, uh, so the Mathematics Education Network at LAFRO, uh, we have lots of professional development materials. Uh, 
relating to mathematics teaching, um, which um, you can find um, via this um, link to Lumen. So that's Loughborough University's Mathematics Education Network. And I also included some um, links to some blog posts that I wrote about this Kakulia if you want uh, to read more about this. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Kinga, for uh, such an insightful presentation on the Dyscalculia. Uh, yeah, we're going to open the floor now for, for questions and trying to get a, a little bit more out of the, the session if we can. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please just pop them in the uh, on the chat or in the question and answer box. Or if there's anything that you'd like um, Kinga to mention or, or talk to about. Um, if if no one's, um, while we wait for people's questions, I, I might throw you a couple of questions, which is, um, so for example, when, when you mentioned the system technology for this calculator, obviously like in dyslexia, we, you know, we can use text to speech and, or speech to text, um, that, that a lot of people use that. Um, and Microsoft has gotten really good at rec recognizing speech. Um, but for uh, this calculator, is there like any um, assistive technology that is kind of like out there making a difference at the moment or there is? Um... Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, maybe it wasn't uh, so clear, but I know that there are some uh, calculators for this, this calculic people and, <laughs> and these use kind of the same uh, mechanism so that you either um, say the numbers and it, it will kind of appear on the screen right. or, or you can uh, kind of enter the number and then it will um, read it out for you so this these are the kinds of things that um, you can do uh, so i think that's that's really the only one that i'm aware of these uh, specialists or special calculators right so it's so there's well i suppose it's a different um, uh, type of uh, um, assistive technology that needs to be um, developed uh, so maybe like like you said if if dyscalculia is getting diagnosed lesser than dyslexia dyslexia is also um, should be being diagnosed more often so it's it's kind of like we're we're a little bit behind on dyslexia yeah, thing. Yeah, so right. we're mm -hmm. even more behind on dyscalculia thing so i guess that kind of follows that path line um, yeah, which is yeah, unfortunate. But... Yes, uh, so it's the same with interventions. So unfortunately, there's much less research yeah. um, in, into mathematics or interventions for mathematics. Um, there's um, Beth Sennett is uh, asking if you could explain visual spatial memory and the impacts of difficulties in this area. So if you could uh, elaborate a bit more on yeah, so, visual so spatial visual, so, so maybe um, if you know about dyslexia, you are probably uh, familiar with the concept of verbal working memory. So so verbal, so verbal working memory is considered like a mental workspace, right? For example, when you um, when you dial a phone number, you will, you will kind of re, uh, remember the sequence of numbers for a short time, and this would be verbal working memory. But you have a similar um, a system to, for uh, for space as well. So spatial sequences. So for example, you could. Uh, I mean, um, for example, if you had a keypad but didn't have any letters or number numbers on them, you could. You might still be able to reproduce a pattern of, of like, you know, like locations or uh, touching locations on this uh, keypad. So it would be just based on the spatial location of these. Um, um, buttons yeah so uh, i guess or or like a spatial working memory for example if you show somebody things on a map and you would have to remember like um, a path that would also be a, an example of using your spatial working memory and i guess research shows that that um spatial working i mean it, you can also think about when you do um arithmetic on paper so add up numbers or or divide you often use like a spatial layout for this so i i guess this is also an example when spatial working memory could be important for performing some arithmetic 
uh, operations. And I suppose, um, I guess, uh, spatial imagination. So if you consider the, the idea of the mental, mental number line, it, it's also where we represent numbers spatially. So uh, across this um, or along this mental number line. So this would be another kind of, um, but I mean, also, um, I mean, spatial processing is is uh, relevant to many areas of math, so like shapes and and measurement and so on. So yeah, um, I, I don't know. I hope this answers <laughs> your question. <laughs> and... um, just uh, I'm gonna follow up on who's a so. Uh, this is a quick one, but uh, it's not related to the discipline itself. It's just there. There will be no certificate. Um, for attending this event, but you do get a confirmation that you attended the event uh, via email. So um, hopefully that can satisfy um, the, the need for it. Um, and moving to the next question. So we've got a question from, I can't see the name because it's cutting the name, but it's Ther yeah, Teresa McDonough. So Teresa asks, what are the, what are indicators of dyscalculia that may be observed in the classroom? particularly with all the secondary students, should all students who struggle with mathematics be considered or are there factors that differentiate this calculia? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe, this, yeah. Is, this is a good question because uh, I suppose, uh, um, I, I think what, uh, what is important is that it's uh, very serious difficulties, so they, they should be um, very much behind, so several years behind uh, age appropriate performance and these difficulties should be um, sustained over a longer period and also so the idea is that even if you provide specialist intervention they would still struggle so it's, it's not just a, um, an issue with maybe missing some content so for example a, a child might miss some math, math lessons due to illness or something and so they might be behind for temporarily for uh, for some reason but um, but then they should be able to catch up with others if they are provided uh, uh, or if they get some support so what you would expect in this calculia is that the problems are more profound and persistent and I guess um, I mentioned these everyday difficulties associated with this calculia so you would expect also some uh, problems with like time estimation, for example, uh, spatial orientation, left and right, distinguishing between left and right, maybe other areas like uh, learning some uh, sequences of actions. So, so yeah, they, there should be uh, other signs as well, apart from problems with mathematics that, um, yeah, that, that they have, uh, yeah. So probably space, time and number, these these are the main uh, domains where you would expect difficulties. And and just to it's uh, still on that question. Um, this is just um, uh, being being inquisitive. But so are these? Do teachers need to sort of, or do you know if teachers are like actively, like taking notes? You know if because when you say uh, persistent um, uh, difficulties or or uh, um, you know over an extended period of time, are we talking? you know, like several years and it, is that because the teachers are like keeping track of, of uh, yeah, I mean, it's great. And... Yeah, you would expect uh, this to be present from quite early on in development. So you would expect right. uh, these problems to appear maybe around the age of six or seven. And uh, yeah, I also, because I often um, have people like, basically telling me their life stories with <laughs> this calculia and sometimes uh, for example um sometimes uh, pupils who try really hard the teachers kind of um uh, how, how to say it so so that the teachers maybe don't realize that they have this calculia because after uh, so i i think what can also happen if if you have a high ability student with this calculia they might learn ways to compensate um, for their problems so you might see that they actually do okay but then um, then they they have to invest extraordinary effort effort into performing at that level so in this sense they also 
Um, this also interferes with their everyday life because uh, they spend so much time trying to uh, catch up on on their um, yeah. maths. And developing strategies as well, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we So I'm going to move on to the next question from Bev, who asks uh, if there is a specific dyscalculia assessment or a combination of assessments that practitioners are using. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are of course, uh, guidelines. So SASC is, is the... Um, like the organization who who published the guidelines for um, for assessment in England and yeah so there are uh, guidelines and it's quite a comprehensive assessment so it doesn't just involve um, mathematics assessment but also like I mentioned working memory uh, performance attention and often um, assessment of literacy skills. So yeah, and, and there are, so, so what I also mentioned in my presentation, the, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, this is also often used by educational psychologists, although it doesn't specify um, the exact like um, instruments that you should use for the assessment. But I think, uh, uh, yeah, definitely you need, I mean, the main basis of the assessment should be uh, mathematics performance on an age appropriate and like, um, yeah, a curriculum based assessment of mathematics skills. So you, you wouldn't really re um, diagnose somebody who doesn't show very significant impairments on, on these tests. Thank you. Um, so I guess my, one of my questions is, like, at, at this point, shouldn't um, what the idea of having an assessment that both diagnoses dyscalculia and dyslexia and perhaps other learning differences, would that be something, like, worth um, uh, investing in? Or do you think, like, they, they still need to be quite specific? Like everyone, you know, if you want to have your dyslexia assessment, it just needs to be focused on dyslexia. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think there's so I, much there's so much crossover, the crossing yeah, over yeah. that mm -hmm. you you start thinking maybe there should just be one assessment that kind of tackles the whole area, but yeah, perhaps mm -hmm. that's a bit unsustainable. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think one one practical consideration is just to keeping down the time of assessment. Yeah, so, I, I yeah, that, and yeah. and I think it's just. Uh, uh, I, for each developmental condition, there's so much research going on into how it's best diagnosed to that particular condition. Um, so I, I think putting together, I, I, I would just say that nobody has the expertise to be able to put together <laughs> like yeah, an assessment a complex, which, yes. which, would, which would be equally like... Which uh, would like, last like... Yeah, so hours. I mean, for the for the future, definitely we should we should have maybe in twenty years time it could be possible. I think for now it's it's it would be very intense. It's yeah. it's like a dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I'm gonna have another question here. So from uh, Gerald, so Gerald asks, could you explain more on the prevalence in UK? Ah, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, so yeah, so I, a, I would yeah. say it's it's and about the meaning of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the prevalence of dyscalculia is estimated to be around uh, five, six percent. So, so the typical estimate that you see in the literature is between three and six percent. But I would say five, six percent is is probably realistic. So, you would, if you are a teacher, you would expect probably at least one child in each class to have uh, dyscalculia. Okay. I hope that. Um... This is your question, Gerald. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time as well. So if anybody's got any more questions uh, before we conclude today's session. Yeah, and I, I mean, feel free to to contact me. You have my email address. So if you have any questions yeah. or you want to... Do you to want to leave that? your uh, email address in the chat? Yeah. So if... Um, yeah, okay. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before to everyone, the, the links and the... Um, the slides will be available online as well. So even for the um, research, uh, if, if you are interested in volunteering for Dr. King's research, uh, once we upload the uh, the slides, you've got the uh, the link and the QR code. 
Um, so if you feel like you want to participate and volunteer some of your time, I'm sure Dr. King would appreciate that very much. Um, yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I think it really, really helps to drive uh, conversation forward and and further research as well because um, like dyslexia, uh, dyscalculia, it's an area where there's still a lot to be discovered and um, this is this is how we get there. So um, that that's why we also like to share as many students and PhD and um, dissertations of of people who are conducting these researches because the more information we can get out there. Uh, the more people can compile and, and find out more about. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. I think we can um, bring the session to a close now. I think everybody is sort of on their way out. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody for coming in and tuning in. I want to thank you again, um, uh, Dr. Kinga, for accepting the invitation and uh, taking the yeah, time. Thanks. thanks to you and thanks for the nice questions as well. Yeah, no problem. It was it was with great pleasure. Um, I learned a lot as well. Like I said, we hadn't done one on this calculia, so it's always really good to uh, to tap into new sources of knowledge. And I think we definitely did that today. And uh, I'm excited to put this on our website as well because it'll be the first time we've got some this calculia related um, content on it. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Kinga. And thank you. Yeah, and every to everyone else, um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and enjoy the weekend. And yeah, we'll see you for our next webinar, which uh, will probably be in January because uh, of the holidays. So again, everybody, thank you so much for coming and have a great day.